Good evening. My name is Shin Yi Pai, and I'm the program director at Town Hall. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and our friends at Third Place Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's virtual presentation with Judy Temes, who will be in conversation with poet and editor Tina Schumann. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. Thank you all for tuning in online. Town Hall is proud to be a community-focused organization in a place where we can share and sustain ideas and creativity, both here in the beautiful Town Hall space and virtually. Town Hall will continue to produce virtual content as we launch into this new season, including our weekly podcast, In the Moment, which will feature a conversation with poet and translator Ian Boyden on October 11th as part of the podcast Lyric World series. Many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form in our digital media library. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Upcoming events include the profound wisdom of black life and literature with Farah Jasmine Griffin and a counter history of feminism with Kyla Schuler and Sophie Lewis. Visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. If you share in Town Hall's vision for a robust community engaged in the arts, science, and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us tonight or becoming a member. Visit our website for more info. But back to this evening's event. Tonight's presentation will be about 60 minutes, including question and answer. To streamline our audience experience, we've changed the Q&A platform for our events. To submit a question, please use your phone or computer to enter app meet.ps backslash temas. We'll drop this link in the chat, and when we get to the Q&A portion, we'll remind folks again where to go. We can't guarantee that we'll be able to address every question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. Please keep your questions concise and in the form of a question. For those who would like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. The program will be available for re-watching immediately following the event. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our Arts and Culture series is supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, the Neshholm Family Foundation, and Wincote Foundation Northwest. Finally, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of our members watching from home. Lastly, you'll want to dive deeper into this evening's topic by purchasing a copy of the author's book. Please use the link in the chat below to pick up your copy through Third Place Books. Judy Temes is a Seattle-based teacher, mother, and former journalist. She was a staff reporter for many seasons at Crane's New York Business, and her work has been published in the Boston Globe, the Patriot Ledger, and the San Fernando Valley Business Journal in Los Angeles. She teaches middle school humanities. Tina Schumann is a widely published poet and editor of the anthology, Two Countries, U.S. Daughters, and Sons of Immigrant Parents. Her work has appeared in the American Journal of Poetry, Ascent, Michigan Quarterly Review, Poetry Daily, Verse Daily, and read on NPR's The Writer's Almanac. Temes's new book, Girl Discussion. Please join me in welcoming Judy Temes and Tina Schumann. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I knew there was going to be a bright light right in my face. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to everyone uh, who's streaming live for joining us as well. Um, I'm excited to talk with Judy about her memoir, her first memoir. Hopefully, there'll be more. <laughs> um, Girl Left Behind from St. Julian's Press. And um, why don't we just uh, dig right in? And Judy, why don't you give us a little synopsis of what your book is about. Great. Thank you so much, Tina. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming out and those of you joining online. Um, Girl Left Behind is a story of family separation. And we've been hearing a lot about family separation in the last few years. Um, in the case of the United States, family separation of children being separated from parents at the border uh, as a way to deter immigration to this country. In my case, family separation to deter emigration or people leaving the country. So my book begins in Hungary and takes place in Hungary in 1969. 
And my father, who really is the one who wanted to emigrate or leave Hungary at this time, um, really wanted to get out of the country desperately. And Hungary's borders were closed. Um, it's a communist country. It's a satellite of the Soviet Union, so there's no uh, leaving the country. That's totally illegal. So he figured out a way to get out using tourist visas to go from Hungary to Austria, which is a Western country. And um, um, one of the stipulations of these tourist visas is that you can go uh, if you were willing to leave one immediate member of your family behind. So I was a child left behind as my parents went, and my brother as well, from um, um, Hungary to Vienna to Rome, and then eventually New York City. And you were um, about five at that time. I was five years old at the time. I was left in the care of my grandmother. Um, if you can picture a babushka lady with the kerchief on her head, no teeth, uh, stooped. Uh, <laughs> she looked 150 years old. <laughs> and I was left in her care, and she was kind to me, and she took care of me for those, um, for those five years. And the story really is the story of, uh, that takes place over the five years uh, from age five to 10, when I was left in her care in this destitute village in Hungary, in a house with no running water, um, no indoor toilets, mm -hmm. and um, in, uh, also living in the house as an interesting cast of characters, including my uncle and my aunt. And um, I'm really, there's no way for any of us to know if we'll ever see each other again. So my parents took this huge gamble that um, perhaps they could leave and maybe I could follow, but they had no way of knowing that that would be the case. And in fact, it was your uncle's house that you were living I was living in, in his yeah. house. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, you know, as a writer, and I, I don't write prose, although I try to, um, I always wonder uh, how long did you sit with this story throughout your life? How long did you think about writing it? And did you, in your teens or your 20s, think about writing yeah. it? Or was it later that... So um, I, um, at some point in my 20s, I read Frank McCourt's beautiful book, Angela's Ashes, which uh, was really a huge inspiration for me. And he had such incredible descriptions of life in Ireland and the poverty under which he lived. And it really made me think about my story of what it was like to live um, in this house, which was uh, on a beautiful lake, but nevertheless, there was a very meager existence. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so that book kind of inspired me to write my story. And then um, um, my children were starting to be around that age mm. of what I was left behind. Uh, two of them are here right now. <laughs> um, one of them who's not here right now, uh, when she was about four or five years old, uh, she was um, in preschool. Mm. And she really had a lot of trouble separating. And I remember we were... Um, I left her at the, at, the pre, at the preschool where she was attending, and there was this huge plate glass window. And she would go up to the plate glass window with her little face uh, up against the window, and she would just look so sad, like, just like, like, even for a few hours, that separation was so meaningful and important. And she would say, Mommy, I'm going to break the window and fly to you. Oh. And, <laughs> and it just made me think, my goodness, this, 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 is, this is hard. And this how is hard, hard that must have been for your mom. And yeah. it made me think about like what was it like and I wanted to recapture those memories of what it was like for me as a child yeah. to be that little kid left behind um, now the story took uh, it took a long time for me to like explore the story research the story talk to my mother talk to my my father was very reluctant to talk about it but to family members mm -hmm. and learn the process of writing, because I attacked the story like a journalist. I was a reporter, and I knew how to write a good story with a great anecdote lead, and I would just like address the who, what, where, when, how, and why, and I would ship it off and add some dialogue and setting and ship it off to, to, to publishers, and of course it was roundly rejected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had to go back and learn how to write a memoir. Like A memoir is a very different kind of craft. It's not an autobiography. It's not a factual telling of your life life. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a chapter of your life told like a novel. Yeah. So I really had to learn that skill of writing, writing that novel. So my children are all adults now, so you can kind of mm -hmm. tell like, mm -hmm. how long that whole process took. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Well, you did an amazing job. It is really engaging like that as, a, as though you're reading a novel and what's going to come next and now what's going to happen. And, yeah. um, One of the discoveries for me was, um, was like just um, how to capture, or how do you tell the story? So I made a very explicit decision to tell the story from Yuditka's point of view. So as that little five, six-year-old, and what is she feeling, what is she thinking? So I had to kind of go back and figure out, like, you know, what, what do little kids think about? Right. And, and recapture some of those memories mm -hmm. and feelings. And the story is told from her perspective as an unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. So you as the reader will hopefully bring your adult intelligence to it to like read right. between the That's lines the trick. Yeah. but yeah <laughs> but but she doesn't know everything yeah yeah and it yeah. was kind of, that was kind of intentional yeah. for the writing mm -hmm. so one of the questions that that actually town hall brought up and was, was was phrased so well is what does it mean to grow up without a sense of home until you define it for yourself yeah so when you're living in a place that's temporary and you're not sure what's going to happen and you're, um, the first thing is as a child, you know, you're living in the immediate uh, moment. You know, children live in the moment. So I figured out how to adapt to this life with my, with my grandmother and I went to school and I, 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 I did adapt to that, to that life and I, under, and I kind of, grew into that mode of living there. But there's always that uncertainty. You know, children need security to grow up and to grow up healthy and, and, mm -hmm. and well-adjusted. And that security wasn't there for me. It was always like, well, when is this going to happen? How is it going to happen? And there's this fear of like, okay, um, it not, not only is it the fear of never seeing your parents again, but the fear of actually then seeing them yeah. and having to live with a family that you, who you don't know anymore. Yeah. So, so there is that right. of like that feeling of displacement and lack of a, a, a real home or mm -hmm. security. And then coming to America, which, you know, maybe one day will be a sequel, but coming to America is also like, it was, it's, there's no home here either because you're part of, you're not comfortable in either world. And yeah. all of us know this and feel this, that you're, you're, it takes a long time to get adapted to a new place and a new country. My father, my mother, they were both strangers in this land for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my father with his polished shoes and his slacks that were like, always creased perfectly and my mother with her wool coat and here they are thrown into the Bronx in the 1970s mm -hmm. in the midst of this counterculture. Yeah. So they were so out of place. Yeah. So creating a home for me didn't come until I was an adult and I had children and my husband and I, yeah. who's here also, we're married 36 years, but we were married so young, I think partly because we needed each other and we mm -hmm. both knew we needed like that place of security and love mm -hmm. in order to to thrive and grow. So we also have moved many times over the years. Uh, I think I once counted, we've had at least 20 homes over the <laughs> 36 years that we're married. Mm -hmm. So what makes a place a home is not the place, it's not the town, it's the people, it's yeah. the relationships that you have. And your grandmother and, did that for you. And my grandmother did that yeah. for me in Hungary. She was that, the key to that. And, and here it's, you know, nothing else really matters. The place doesn't matter. It's the, it's the community that you create and the relationships that you nurture. So let's talk a little bit about retrospective forgiveness for an mm -hmm. unintended wound. In fact, a wound that was delivered with the intention of doing good. Mm -hmm. Did you come to a place with your parents oh, I or your the uncle? Show. Where is the clicker? Oh, is this it? Yeah, that's it for the okay. photos. Yeah. Let's get some photos going. Oh. All right. <laughs> That's me, that. my, mo my mother, and my grandmother. And retrospective forgiveness, this is the house in which I, in, in where I was now. Um, th this was once a house that belonged to a, a very wealthy man, I think, before the war, and then it w went to my grandmother, and maintaining that house was very difficult for them. Mm. And that's my grandmother who took care of me. So she was that rock of, that created that home for me. And let me get to this. So forgiveness. 
retrospective forgiveness. So this is a photo of my father. Uh, he is the boy to the right, who looks so much like my son. <laughs> no. To the right. Okay. And, and that's his entire family. So my father grew up in a little town called Mohac in Hungary. And um, when he was 18 years old, the war came to Hungary, and um, he's Jewish, and his entire family was taken away to uh, the gas chambers, and they were all murdered. And my father survived because he was 18 years old at the time, and um, they put him into a forced labor camp. So, so, but, so he was gone in forced labor, and when he returned to, to his hometown, everything was gone. His parents, uh, his, his uh, little brother, um, the man in the middle is his half-brother, who actually also survived, but the others all died. And so this is, I'm, I'm mentioning this because this is what drove my father, I think, to do what he did. I mean, the Holocaust and the impact that it had on him, I think it, it, it does not, it, it, it has a huge impact on anybody who has experienced anything like that, a loss like that. And he was very much a broken man because of that. And I think that he felt like he, he had to get out of there. So one of the ironies of the, is that is that he, um, after the war, he went to medical school and he became a doctor. That's where he met my mother, and she also was a doctor. And um, the, the communist government basically makes these decisions of where you're going to practice once you graduate school. And, they, and he had ambitions of going to Budapest or going to a bigger city at least or, or, or continuing to study. And inst instead he was stuck right back in the same town from which, in which he grew up, Mohac. So there he is at 22, trying to start his life, and he is in the very same place where he grew up with those same memories haunting him. So I think that must have been incredibly hard. Like, can you imagine just like every day seeing the things of your childhood and having to make a new life there? But he did, and he got married and he had children and by 1969 he he had to go he just like made the decision i mean i think it wasn't so much that he there was that intention but i think he was very much driven by the events of the holocaust to to just get out of there so you never felt there was something that you needed to forgive your parents for you understood on some level that it had yeah. to happen i so, yeah, so the forgiveness part is more like I... So forgiveness is such a loaded word in some ways, and, and I think it's only also, like, in some ways, a word of privilege. Like, you're, you, you forgive someone if you have power, or you can forgive someone if you have some kind of privilege. So, so the whole time, once I arrived in America, the only word that, that the only thing, the only feeling that we were really allowed is gratitude. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, it's, you should be absolutely grateful that you are here in America and we went through what you went through in order to like be in this wonderful country. So gratitude was the only feeling. Yeah. Um, forgiveness was something that I only started to think about much later in life when I really started to think about the choices that they made. So, Yes, he was driven to leave, but it's also a choice because, yeah. because you, he, they weren't destitute. I mean, my parents were actually fairly well off in Hungary. I mean, a lot of people think, you know, under communism, you don't, you know, you're on bread lines and all that. And there were those things, but my parents were both physicians. So they had a car, they had a television, they, they had, they traveled, they had even a little vacation home. Mm -hmm. So they, it wasn't that bad. But I think for my father, he just like couldn't stomach it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and I had a good friend who said the other day, he emigrated here from China. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I asked him, well, why did you come from China? What made you come? And he said, I, I felt like I was suffocating. I couldn't live in that place. Mm -hmm. And I think my father felt that way too. I think he felt like he was suffocating. He yeah. never could speak up. And, the, and anytime he would say the wrong thing, you know, he, there was this threat of prison. So, like, you know, he would, 
there's this story of, of, of there's a committee of, of doctors at the hospital, and I think somebody makes this joke, or somebody says, well, doctor, you know, this is our socialist country, from each according to their ability, to each according to their need. And my father goes, and he's like, he's kind of like a joker. He says, well, what if I need a Cadillac? You know, <laughs> so he was that kind of, a, you know, he, he mm. joked about these things. But also that could like, you know, get What's you in trouble. What's the definition of need? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. The, and a comment like that could get you in trouble. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he lost his position. He was demoted mm. from Mohach. He was sent to a smaller village. And he just couldn't do it anymore. Yeah. He yeah. couldn't do it anymore. Understandable. Yeah. So getting back to little Judica, <laughs> um, as children, and we can't really tell ourselves logically what's happening to us to get through a situation. Do you remember things uh, and people maybe that got you, helped get you through that time? Yeah. yeah. So there was my grandmother. Let's go back to her. <laughs> yeah, there, there she is. So she was, was uh, everything, you know, to get, uh, who got me through this. I mean, she was this... She, was, she had a heart of gold. Every single night, she pulled a chocolate bar from her pocket, and she would give me a chocolate bar. Somehow, she saved this chocolate bar every single night. Of course, my teeth rotted, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but she was an incredible person. She pulled me on a wagon to school so I wouldn't have to walk. She pulled me on a sled to school in, in the snow. Um, she slept on this ratty old mattress, mm -hmm. you know, and... Um, so she was, she was my protector, and I think if it wasn't for her, I, I'm, I'm not sure what would have happened. Mm -hmm. So she was very much instrumental um, in terms of that. And then I'll flip to this. <laughs> we, love, we love dogs. All children need dogs. And my grandmother, who's in the background there, washing clothes with her hands. Um, and that was my dog. His name was Blind Crow. And uh, I called him, I named him Blind Crow because he had these dark black eyes and I couldn't imagine that he could see anything. With those <laughs> black eyes, he had to be blind. <laughs> so, so, and I won't go into telling you what happened with the dog, but um, read the book. Yeah. <laughs> it, there's a good story in there about that little dog. And I'll say that one of my saving graces was fairy tales. So I, once I learned how to read as a little kid, I had a hiding place, I had a cardboard box, and I would climb into this cardboard box, and, um, and there, was, there weren't many books in our village. We had no library. We had no, the textbooks were all um, official communist textbooks, um, and you know the information in them was what you would expect. You know, Americans are greedy with like you know giant like uh, dollar bills for eyes. You know, <laughs> um, but there were there were like two or three books in the house, and one of them was Grimm's Fairy Tales. And I would get this book, and I would climb into the box. And Every time I was sad, every time I missed my mother, when I broke my arm, when I went to the beach and it turned out that my mother had, didn't send me a bikini but the underwear, <laughs> and I was totally humiliated and embarrassed, um, I would climb into the box and I would tell myself that you know, I am like Cinderella or I'm like Sleeping Beauty and eventually the prince will come to save me. <laughs> So, you know, fairy tales are important in the lives of children. You know, they help us understand good and evil. They help us understand, um, and they give hope in some way yeah. to, to, to people who are feeling powerless. Yeah. So I think that was very important for me, those, those, those tales. So speaking of tales, your, your uncle is quite a domineering character in your childhood during those years. Would you like to read a section that talks about your uncle and Yeah, yeah. So my so my uncle, um, the story with him was that um, he had he had a tragic life in some ways as well, but he in in this household with my grandmother and my aunt, he was such a like you said, a dominating he was really a tyrant. He like ordered these women in the house constantly. And um, he, he did something that basically um, elongated the amount of time that it took for our family to be reunited. So he basically had me declared abandoned by my parents um, who were here in America. 
And by doing this, uh, it added this whole extra layer of bureaucratic complexity to my whole emigration. To, so getting the Hungarian government to let me out was really difficult. And then getting the, this, this um, child care agency to agree to everything added like months and if not years to the yeah. whole process. So I'll read a section um, where my godfather comes to visit. And um, my godfather was instrumental in all this because um, he, my mother reached out to him because the whole process was stuck and she thought maybe he could help. So this scene is a scene between my godfather and my uncle um, over this process of having me declared abandoned. So I'll read that, I'll read that section. All right, let's see. Okay. We came to talk about Yuditka's situation. My godfather started. We received a letter from her mother. Did you know they're thinking about coming back? They aren't getting anywhere with the consulate there. They turned them away, said they would never let Yuditka go. I'm concerned, Zolibachi. I don't think it would be a good decision for them to come back, but I didn't know they, were they, were, they want to come home, my uncle said. But I've ha I have had contact with the district judge here, and frankly, he is not optimistic. His feeling is that the parents were traitors. Did he suggest anything that could be done? Zolibachi took a long puff on the cigarette hanging from a wooden smoking stick, blew, and spoke slowly. Did he suggest? He did suggest that I have her declared abandoned, legally speaking, that is. Abandoned? Legally, yes. What does that mean? It means the state is her legal guardian, and they pay me a small stipend to keep her here instead of the orphanage. You must admit that's better for her. As for us, it means a little more income. Not much, but it helps. Do her parents know this? I assume they would have been notified. You mean to tell me you had their daughter declared officially abandoned and you did not tell her parents? I didn't think that was my job to do that. I don't even know what to say, said Silide, stunned. You know, Silide, it's not easy taking care of another kid. We need to feed her, clothe her, it adds up. This way the government gives us a little something every month. Celide's jaw dropped. Have you actually done this? Legally, that is. Did I do it? Of course I did. We need the money. Do you understand what this could, that this could have some serious consequences? I didn't see you dropping everything to take the kid. You with your university appointment and your modern apartment and one kid to feed. Please don't tell me what I should and shouldn't do to look out for my family. But Laszlo and Piroshka left plenty of money, an entire salary from what I Yes, and that lasted a year. Look around you. Do we look like we have, that we live in luxury? This is an old house, expensive to heat. Do you want to see what it cost me to buy coal in the winter? I think we have found the root of the problem. This must be why the process is stalled and everything is taking so long. With all due respect, Zolibachi, do you understand what you might have done? That money they pay you, that extra little bit to pay the heating bills, means that the state has legal custody of Yuritka. They can make this process as hard as they want, and it seems like they are. Now you see, that's where you're wrong. That is not the problem, I heard my uncle say. The problem is that Jew who left the country and abandoned his kid. Good riddance too, I say. They should all leave. Let them all go to America or Israel, whatever is left of them. Let them go wherever they please. Piroshka should come back. She, should, she made a mistake marrying that man in the first place. Now she can finally undo it. Let him stay there. Let her come back and take care of the kid. I stopped listening. There was that word again, Jew. Like a bad dream, it kept coming back. And now a new word, abandoned. Had my parents really left me here for good? I went into the bedroom. I found my big cardboard box, climbed inside, closed the flaps, and opened Grimm's ta fairy tales. I turned to the story of Cinderella. I imagined my mother was like Cinderella's mother. She's in heaven, in paradise. She wants to come back, but she can't. She's calling to me, telling me it will be okay. Wait patiently, just one more Christmas. She's, she's looking to find a way, but she's trapped. The gates are closed. She can't get out. I can't get in. I'm Cinderella, stuck with the mean stepmother who doesn't care and the vain stepsisters who just care about being pretty. 
They take the things my mother sends and go to parties leaving me home. But wait, there's a fairy godmother. Perhaps she's come. The sun set early, the room grew dark, and I fell asleep with the book glued to my face. It was nighttime by the time I heard my grandmother come to the bedroom and peered into my box. Zhuja and Silart had gone home, she said. They realized I was sleeping and didn't want to wake me. My mother was gone, and now my fairy godmother was gone too. That's very good. That's that section. Yeah. yeah. It must be tough to have heard, overheard that as a kid and try to figure out what you didn't really even know what the word Jew meant or... Yeah, no. yeah, that, 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 that whole realization came in the, because um, my father clearly hid his whole identity. I mean, he was not practicing, not too afraid to, really. Yeah. Um, and, um, and the context of me learning what, what it was to be Jewish was in the context of my uncle's, you know, calling my father those names. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Um, I, I did a little bit of, of writing, of r creative writing here because mm -hmm. um, I, I really didn't know this growing up. I learned this in doing the research on the book later on. I had gone back to Hungary. I, I talked to my godparents mm -hmm. who, you know, were there and very helpful. And I, and I talked to various relatives. And then I went back and kind of recreated that scene sure. um, to kind of show the reader, you know, what, what this was and how this came about. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. So uh, I wonder if you'd like to talk a little bit about the congressman who helped your parents uh, reunite you and then yeah. a little bit about what your feelings are about immigration policies in the U.S. Yeah, so <laughs> um, actually the congressman is right there. Um, he is, um, so that's his newsletter. That's, so on the right is my uh, passport to emigrate from Hungary. And the, uh, the, so the congressman, so I, so after five years or so, the Cold War starts to thaw and um, President Nixon went to China and opened up relations a little bit. And Hungary was in this situation where I think as a country, they wanted to uh, become more aligned with um, America and a little bit more. Um, and those relations were there. And I think that was kind of the backdrop. And Jonathan Bingham was a congressman from the Bronx, and um, he um, he was I think he sat on the on the on Foreign Relations Committee of Congress and um, of the House of Representatives, and he somehow got wind of my parents' situation, and he wanted to help. Mm -hmm. And this just goes to show you the power of our, of our leaders. They can do these things. Mm -hmm. um, so he reached out to the Hungarian consulate. He put pressure on them. And so this was around 1974 uh, when finally the word came that I'd be allowed to come to America. And my godfather, who is, uh, you heard about in the story a little bit, arrives to my grandmother's house in the middle of the night, in the middle of this storm. And we had really, like, it, it took so long. It was already, like, four years or so. And for me as a child, I had almost, like, moved on and forgotten that my... I didn't forget my parents, but but I, 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 I didn't know what they looked like, you know? There weren't a lot of letters, even. There weren't a lot of pictures coming across from America. We had, obviously, no internet and FaceTime or anything mm -hmm. like that. So, so I, there were these letters that came, but my mother would write a letter um, every Christmas and said, we hope to see you next Christmas. And finally, by the time I'm like eight, nine, I, next Christmas? Like, mm -hmm. That's like forever. that's forever to a child. Like mm -hmm. I, how, and and I'm trying. I'm figuring out that time is like, you know, what 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 that is, and um, so he arrives. The the uh, the um, my my godfather in the middle of the night, and and the, uh, the 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 news is you have a month to get the child ready, and she's going to be going to America. So. Um, so he was a very important figure in my life, and he basically reunited our family. And that picture of the four of us is um, my, my dad looking very happy there, <laughs> um, taken shortly after I arrived. And, you know, of course, this like being like an awkward 10-year-old, my, my parents didn't know what to welcome him with, so they would like, they had a little doll like that. <laughs> I was like, I'm done with dolls by that point. <laughs> Um, so, 
so that's um, Jonathan Bingham was very important. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. And I know it's a huge subject, but what are your feelings now about uh, Hungary and how things are going there? And is there hope or is there? Yeah, I mean, there was so much hope in Hungary in 1989. I love this writer, Anna Applebaum. She writes, um, she's a columnist for, I believe, The Atlantic. And she writes a lot about Poland and what's been going on there. And in one of her recent books, she wrote about how in 1989, the, everyone was celebrating, and to the to the extent that you know they set off fireworks, that that the Berlin Wall has fallen, and freedom is now finally coming, and Hungary especially. I mean, it's it's like a country that's been on like 500 years of domination under some other power. You know, the the Turks took mm. over Hungary, and then the Austri Austrian em Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Austrians really dominating Hungary, and then. Germany for a brief moment and then the Soviet Union and finally Hungary has a chance to like make its own path and unfortunately right now it's not looking very good there is a prime minister there who is not a lover of um, freedom and liberty and he um, he has basically um, gone out of his way to um, crush the press and to intimidate the press to um, get rid of the an independent judiciary, and it's a country that's very much almost looking like um, it's it's definitely not on a positive path right now. Um, it's keeping immigrants out, like all the uh, Syrian refugees who were trying to get f through Hungary to get into Germany. They've built like a whole wall around the, the country again. So, and to see like our, you know, th recently I think. Um, um, there was, a, I think, a Fox News person who went to and had a meeting with Viktor Orban and to hold him out as like someone, for an American to go and visit him and hold him out as like someone we should look up to. Mm. I mean, read your constitution, read your declaration of independence. This is like not the values that we want to aspire to. Yeah. So that's, that's very sad for me to watch that happening. Yeah. Well, we have enough time, and I'd, I'd love you to close out by reading a section uh, about, I won't give too much away, but I, <laughs> just the little closing section of you coming to America and being on All a right. plane for the first time. All right. Very good. And uh, can I get someone to help me with the questions that might be coming in? Because I'm not seeing them, unfortunately. I, I see one. Technical that's, difficulty. But I don't know. Oh, are those the questions down there? I guess we could just use that. All right. So after um, um, I got permission to actually finally arrive to America, finally come to America, um, I had to travel on a plane to get here. My grandmother, in all her wisdom, dressed me head to toe in red because she knew that my she had a feeling that my parents may not recognize me at John F. Kennedy Airport. <laughs> So I was dressed in red shoes, red stockings, a red dress, a red hat, a red coat. So, but, um, <laughs> and I was very mad at her for that because I thought she was trying to make me look like Little Red Riding Hood or something. <laughs> um, so this scene from the book is um, flying alone on a plane to America. And of course, it's a very frightening thing. Um, and at one point, I get stuck in the bathroom <laughs> on the plane. <laughs> so um, let's see where I should. Um, so um, um, basically, I had to really pee very badly. <laughs> so it starts like this. But I couldn't wait anymore. I unbuckled the seat and ventured to the back of the plane in search of a bathroom. I found a door with the image of a toilet. I pushed the door open. What magic this was. Somehow they fit every convenience of this tiny space down to a soft white tissue paper dispenser. If KLM only knew what we would have done for such tissues in our village school. They even figured out how to make a toilet flush in the sky. I sat down on the tiny white contraption and looked around at all the buttons. I wanted to try everything. I turned on the sink and mixed hot water with cold. I tried the soap dispenser and worked up a lather. I bathed my hands in the warm water. I took the tissue paper and filled up my pockets with it, just in case. I looked in the mirror. Before me, I saw a girl I barely recognized. 
did I really look like that? My red clothes that somehow tinted my red clothes had somehow tinted my entire face, my cheeks, my nose, even my eyes seemed red. I worried if this was if this was I worried if this too would cause a problem. I put the thought out of my head and turned to leave the enchanted bathroom. I pushed down on the doorknob to leave, but nothing happened. I pushed again, harder this time, still nothing. I stood back, trying to study the situation. It was a small door, metal. Maybe I had to push even harder. I shoved it hard with my shoulder. Nothing. My heart raced. I looked at the knob again. It was round, different than doorknobs in Hungary. How did it work? I tried to pry it up. I tried to pry, pry it up and down again, then pushed, it to the, then pushed to the left and to the right. Panicked, I began to knock on the door, but no one came. Where was that friendly flight attendant with the perky hat? I imagined the plane crossing the Atlantic Ocean, landing in New York while I was stuck in the bathroom. I imagined it taking off again to its next destination. Maybe it would fly to Brazil, where they would finally find me, and not knowing what to do with me, stick me in a home for abandoned children. I banged on the door even harder. I would have yelled, but I didn't know what words to yell. I wished my cousin had taught me the word for help. Suddenly, after what felt like a long time, the door fell open and I stumbled into the plane's kitchen. Relieved, I found, I found my seat and tried to calm down. I'd have a lot to learn in America, I thought, starting with how to open a door. <laughs> That's great. Well, we do have some questions from the audience and the first one was one we touched on a little bit, but do you think there'll be a sequel? <laughs> Hard to think about right I've now. I've been I'm asked sure. that a few times. Um, I'm going to give it a try. Yeah. I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> It'd be great to hear from Judy's yeah. uh, adult perspective or young yeah. adult perspective. Young what, adult perspective. Yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, in some ways that's a more typical story because mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a story of so many immigrants and how we adjust to America and, and a new life. But in some ways, it's also a harder story to tell yeah. because I'm going to have to delve in a lot more in some ways to my parents and their stories. Right. Um, but I think that will be a good thing. Yeah. And yeah, you know, my mom was 14 when she, when she came here, and in the midst of puberty and not speaking the language and having to go to a brand new school with yeah, yeah all all of that, all of that, all of that. Yeah. All of that. Uh, did you ever see your grandmother again after you emigrated? I did. I did. I, I had a chance to go back. So once my parents got their um, citizenship, which was just so they had been here five years before me. So two years later, they were they were citizens, and as citizens, they were able to travel back and go back. So my mother and I took a trip. I was about. Um, 13 or so, mm. and um, got a chance to see my grandmother. And of course, when you go back and see the house in which you grow back, in which you were a small child, all of a sudden everything seems so much smaller. Um, and my grandmother felt so small, and just like to like hold her in, in my arms. I was already, you know, my height, you know, mm -hmm. I had pr pretty tall and had grown up. Um, so just that feeling of holding her in my arms felt yeah. felt very special. Yeah, um, bad. yeah, yeah. I got to name a child after her. You what? <laughs> I got to name a child after her. Oh, wonderful! <laughs> my wonderful. daughter Katie. <laughs> uh, this says, did your parents keep your Magyar heritage alive at home, or did they completely assimilate? Um, that's that's interesting. The Magyar her heritage, yeah. yeah my, I mean, they Magyar, 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 yeah, Hungarian. Um, to some extent, you know, mm. we 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 had some Hungarian food. My father loved Hungarian sausage. Mm -hmm. You know, we had um, palacinta. My son loves this palacinta, which is like a, a, it's like it's a crepe that you stuff with like cottage cheese and. Mm. And um, and while my parents were al were alive, we spoke Hungarian in the house, mm -hmm. so that was definitely something. Um, but you know, I think I think for all of us, assimil especially my brother and I, that that was the goal. The goal was assimilation and yeah. to fit in. That's what my yeah. mom was told too. Yeah. You're in America now. You You're speak in America English now. And, yeah. Put that put that behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any, any others coming in, but we're ready to take more questions if you've got them. Audience. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> this has been this has been great. We're, Judy and I are working really hard to not give away too much in the book while also <laughs> getting your your taste buds uh, going for it. It's a I read a lot of memoir and I was just have a lot of admiration for somebody who can do that, who can yeah. tell that story of your life while yeah. keeping Thank the reader you. engaged. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think the goal, like I said in the beginning, the goal was to try to write it like a, like it would read like a novel. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I could talk, I think you had a question about um, um, what it was like to, to arrive at that point of understanding uh, with my parents. Mm -hmm. Um, I could talk a little bit about that because one of the, the greatest gifts that I had was the last five years of my mother's life. She had Parkinson's disease and um, um, somehow I was able to convince her to actually move in with us. And she came to live with us in the last five years. And um, it was really so, it was such a gift because in a, in a sense we were able to recapture those five years of our separation mm -hmm. and really... Um, and, and it was during that time that she, she and I talked a lot about the story and I, and I did a lot of, you know, you know, we processed a lot. And um, um, one of the things that I really felt like I needed to ask her before the end of her life was to ask her this question of like, well, how did you make that choice of like following your husband and choosing a husband over a child? Because that is for her, and it was an intentional choice. Mm -hmm. I think for my father, um, like I said, more of a compulsion to go. But for her, you know, I think he basically he basically said to her, "I'm going, and you can decide for yourself what you want to do." And I needed to understand that. And she was also diagnosed with dementia at some point in mm -hmm. her at that point in her life. And I felt like I needed to ask her, "How could you?" make that choice because I know and I know that I stand from a point of you know privilege you know that you know we're living in a in a free country and uh, I, I am so grateful to have everything that we have here and I, then I don't have to make a choice like that but I just needed to also know that mm -hmm. and she had this moment when she you know I, I kind of talk about this in the epilogue of the book where she breaks down and she cries, and with tears in her eyes, she says, I was a coward. Mm -hmm. And that word was so powerful for me when she said those words, not because she really was, because I, I don't think she was. She was incredibly brave. Like all immigrants who come to this country, they, they risk so much and give up so much and sacrifice so much. Mm -hmm. She was incredibly brave. I mean, she's 45, 46 years old when she came. Mm -hmm. um, no, no knowledge of English. She had to work. Uh, she was a physician, and now she has to work as a maid in America. Yeah. Um, um, you know, my, my father was usually pretty good to her, but not always. Mm -hmm. You know, he, you know, um, they had their challenges as a as a couple and marriage. And for her to say that I was a coward, um, in some ways, acknowledged the loss. Yeah. Acknowledge that that this was a hard choice, and it and it and it had a loss for me and for her and right. all of us in some right. way. And I said to her, you know, I think you mentioned forgiveness before, and I write in the book that you know, she didn't ask for forgiveness, nor was forgiveness needed, because I think what we needed was not for me to forgive her, but to really understand right. and to understand who she was and and yeah. what the choices that she made. Yeah. And I think with understanding comes forgiveness. Naturally. And and, yeah. and and I'm I'm glad that she and I had that closure around that because it was it was important for me to know. Mm -hmm. And it was great to have her living with us too. It can take she was, decades to yeah. hear the thing that you needed to hear even it if did. you didn't it think did. that you did. It did. Yeah. It did. Yeah. So and, the next yeah. question was yeah. one I, I was going to ask, and it's, what is your relationship with your brother like, and how does he see what happened? Great question. How much older is he yeah, than you? Yeah, my brother is um, seven and a half years older, and one of the wonderful things about the way life kind of happens, one of his sons now happens to live here and be a neighbor, oh. <laughs> so that's really nice. Um, but... Um, I think he didn't really love the idea of me writing this book initially. 
he, he was in some ways kind of opposed to it. He was like, why do you want to rehash? You know, like a lot of family members feel, why do you want to hash, you know, put this in the public domain? Like, who, like this, is, this is not, you know, uh, don't, the, the past is the past. Let's move on. You know, mm -hmm. we, we've been granted this opportunity to live here. Let's, let's just move on. But in the last couple of years, um, I really felt like at least um, he needed to know from me, and, he, and I needed to know from him his thoughts about the book. So I handed him the manuscript before it was published, and he read it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he had a funny reaction. He said, "He said, well, it, I I read it so I read it quickly. I really liked it, but I'm not sure who cares." <laughs> so. Well, a lot of people do. <laughs> So, yeah. He doesn't read memoirs, clearly. <laughs> but he and I have a, a good relationship now, a close relationship, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah. 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 It's sometimes also hard to see your own story as, as worthy because yeah. you're living it every yeah. day. And, and he has an equally worthy story. Uh, I mean, his sure. story of, of coming with my parents mm -hmm. was just as traumatic, yeah. if not more in some ways. Yeah. In some ways, I was... A, the protected child because of my grandmother. Mm, mm -hmm. And he had to live through the whole trauma of seeing the ups and downs. Right. You know, my father was, like I said, you know, he, he had these incredible highs, but he also had incredible lows. And my father, my brother saw that and that was hard for him. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. maybe he'll explore that. Maybe he'll yeah. write a book. Yeah. <laughs> Two more questions. Uh, did your father's immigration give him the life he wanted? Ah, that's a great question. You know, um, when you make the kind of choice that he did, um, he, he, he always, in, in some ways, he had his demons. And those demons, you know, tied up with the Holocaust and everything and the loss and the trauma that he suffered. Um, and that didn't, go, that didn't go away Everywhere once go, he was. That are, follows yeah. you. Yeah. So, you know, he, he, he got the material things that he wanted, um, in some ways, and, and of course, you know, he had the freedom to, to say whatever he wanted, whatever was on his mind, if he wanted to talk about or joke about how bad the president was, he could say that out loud, and, mm -hmm. you know, that's his, that's his right as an American citizen, thank God. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, like, that turmoil, I think that that was still there, sure. and, um, and um, I'm not sure that... He I mean, he just, you just don't, you don't get over that, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and the idea yeah. of what maybe he would have acquired maybe didn't quite meet the reality of... It. So, that, sometimes that's always the thing, yeah. you know, immigrants, yeah. you know, look for opportunity, economic opportunity, and, and, and liberty and freedom is there too. Mm -hmm. So I think he got the liberty and the freedom, he definitely got that. Mm -hmm. um, and he got the economic opportunity part as well. Um, but that inner emotional work yeah. of what the loss that he suffered, I think that, I think that followed him. Follows us, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you speak Hungarian fluently, and what about your children? Beszélek magyarul egy kicsit. I speak a little bit of Hungarian. Um, I feel a little sad that I didn't teach my children Hungarian. It's an incredibly difficult language. Mm. Um, it's, it's, it's very hard to master, <laughs> and I tried, and I married an American man, and I think it just became kind of hard for it to, to yeah. like, you know, stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, so, unfortunately, they, they don't. But it's yeah. never too late to learn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I regret, too, that I don't speak Spanish fluently. She, my mom could have probably just spoken to me in the home, but the idea was it would have made it more difficult for me mm -hmm. to learn, and, and, which is not true. Kids acquire language so easily, yeah. easily but... Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's um, true. You mentioned about you being inspired by a book to write yours. Um, what about this book inspired you? The style, the story, I think you said the, the details, the images. Yeah, yeah. So, so two stories. So, so Angela's Ashes inspired me very much. Uh, he's an incredible writer, mm -hmm. and just like the details of how he told that story, and um, just 
you know, uh, living right there alongside him, following him. The other book that really inspired me was Jeanette Waza's Glass Castle. Oh, yeah. um, and um, she's also a wonderful writer. And I tried, so she also writes with the, with the unreliable narrator, mm -hmm. uh, the child narrator yeah. uh, telling the story. And it begins with, you know, she's cooking hot dogs or something and her tutu is set on fire. Mm -hmm. And you know from that scene that, you know, that these are like really negligent parents. But she doesn't know that. She doesn't feel that way. So, mm -hmm. so reading that book, understanding the structure of that book really helped me write mm -hmm. my story as well. And, and they both um, yeah. had very hard childhoods, but yes. you never feel in the story that they're exactly. saying, woe was me. No, you know? exactly, it's, exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I hope that's what readers take away. I think mm -hmm. uh, somebody, a friend of mine who read the book, said that I, she loved the fact that Yuditka is very plucky and mischievous. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I, don't, I don't want readers to feel sorry for me. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, I had an incredible opportunity to like get out of mm -hmm. Hungary and live a life here mm -hmm. and even there you know I the, the kids yeah. are adaptable and there was, resilient. And there was a lot of love on on either end as yes. well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, all the questions we have for now. Well this has been okay. great Judy. All Thank right. you so much. Thank you. It's been great to talk about it and <laughs> buy the book. <laughs> Thank you so much. There'll be, there'll be a signing afterwards. Yeah. And sign books. Yeah. In the library, Ooh. I guess, which is this way. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you for so coming. much, everybody, really for coming it. out. Yeah, thank you.